All right, uh, let's get started. So good morning, everyone, or for our friends and colleagues based in Asia or Europe, good afternoon or good evening. Welcome to the Central Asia Program uh, Seminars. My name is Sebastian Perus. I'm a research professor working with the Central Asia Program at the Institute for European Russian and Eurasian Studies at George Washington University. So we are going to focus today on a very uh, important point, a very important topic, which is uh, the climate change, but more specifically on how uh, climate change has been overlooked by the research community. And to talk about uh, that, uh, this very important topic, we have a great speaker today, Indra Overland. Uh, Indra is a research professor and the head of the Center for Energy Research at the Norwegian Institute of International Affairs, the NUP, is a very famous and prestigious institute, NUP. Uh, he has conducted research and field work in all the Central Asian states and he's been responsible for cooperation between the OSC Academy in Kyrgyzstan and UP uh, since 2007. Uh, Indra is also the author of many publications. He has, for example, co-edited a book entitled uh, Caspian Energy Politics, Azerbaijan, Kazakhstan and Turkmenistan. Uh, he authored and caused and many papers and book chapters, including uh, Central Asia is a missing link in analysis of critical materials for the global clean energy transition, which was published uh, in the journal One Earth. Uh, he published um, book chapters such as resource extraction, environmental concerns, and social license to operate in Kyrgyzstan, which was published in an edited volume published by Routledge and many others. I'm not going to uh, sit uh, all, uh, all of them. Uh, you can access many of uh, Indra Overland's paper by clicking on the links that you can find the announcement actually will circulate it for this event. And also, uh, Professor Overland has been seated in many, uh, many journals, newspapers, including the Financial Times, the Wall Street Journal, Newsweek, the Associated Press, and the Guardian and many others. So uh, I specify that Indra's presentation will be based today on a paper he actually co-authored with uh, Roman Vakumchuk and Sophie Deleuze, Hakon Fossum uh, Sekbaken and Karina Stendhal, uh, which has been published uh, in the journal Central Asian Survey. So after uh, Indra's presentation, we will have a Q&A session, so please feel free to send your questions in the chat box. So thank you very, very much, Indra, for being with us uh, today and for sharing your findings on such uh, an important topic. And the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Sebastian, for the very kind introduction and uh, for hosting me here at the very prestigious Central Asia program of IERIES and the George Washington University. Um, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, <clears throat> so uh, the paper that I am, that is the basis for the presentation I'm giving today, uh, here you can see it, here's a quick uh, look at it. Uh, and as uh, Sebastian mentioned, um, this is a, uh, co-authored paper lead the I'm not the the lead author that is my colleague Roman Vakulchuk at NUPI which is the Norwegian Institute of International Affairs um, and we wrote this paper in uh, cooperation with colleagues from another Norwegian Institute uh, CICERO which is specialized in climate research um, so it is a, a joint effort of uh, area studies people like Roman and me and uh, uh, people specialized in climate research. Um, and this research is not part of a funded research project. It grew out of a discussion <clears throat> that we had among the authors uh, about the lack of research on climate change and related issues, decarbonization, renewable energy, and so on in Central Asia. Um, and each of the five co-authors brings uh, a different competence on a different area. And uh, one of us, Anne Sophie, uh, is a natural scientist, which is which is unusual for us. It's the first time we're publishing together with a, a natural scientist, uh, and a big pleasure and a big uh, uh, and very rewarding, I think, because in in climate research there is uh, 
a very profound interdependency between natural and social science analysis. So I am assuming that uh, the audience knows this region very well. So this is uh, superfluous, but just in case somebody's not familiar with uh, uh, Central Asia, we're talking about these five countries I'm showing on the map, uh, which are the five uh, successor republics of the Soviet Union that end in Stan. <clears throat> so why is this topic of climate change and Central Asia important? Temperatures in Central Asia are rising faster than the average rise in the world. So uh, set, climate change is more dramatic in uh, Central Asia in this regard. In addition, uh, Central Asia has uh, particular vulnerabilities which make it particularly acute, the threat. Um, these include shrinking glaciers, uh, the possibility of destabilized river flow, um, impacts on agriculture and fisheries, and the capacity of the states in the region to handle things and uh, political relations between uh, ethnic groups and states in the region. And climate change could exacerbate tensions over water, which already exist to some extent, uh, both within states and between the states. Like eco-migration might rise, having social, economic, and political knock-on effects. <clears throat> And uh, climate change might also aggravate socioeconomic inequalities. And I'll particularly emphasize the importance of glaciers. 6% um, of the territory of Tajikistan and 4% of the territory of Kyrgyzstan is clover covered in glaciers. So these are some of the states in the world that have uh, most glaciers. And these glaciers combined hold over a thousand cubic kilometers of water, which is enough to feed the two major river systems in the region, the Amu Darya and the Sir Darya, uh, for 10 years. <clears throat> so th these, these glaciers form a very important part of the catchment area, that is where the, where the water for these two river systems originates um, and the downstream feed uh, uh, the water supply of much of Central Asia. And the big concern is that rising temperatures are leading to the melting of glaciers in most of the region. And this could have, um, this could undermine two of the important buffer functions of the glaciers. So what glaciers normally do in the region is they stabilize the river flow over, over many years because there's always a glacier there and it always melts no matter what the snowfall is. And they ensure that the rivers flow during the summer when there's less precipitation. So the precipitation comes during the, uh, winter, the autumn and winter. Um, and there's lower river flow. And then uh, in the spring, the, the river flow increases just as precipitation is going down. And of course, the summer is when you need the river flow for irrigation. So the glaciers have important functions, both in terms of stabilizing over long, many over decades, and uh, in terms of ensuring the river flow in the summertime. As these glaciers are vanishing at an accelerating rate, um, the concern is that the, the, the river flow will be stabilized. So if you imagine if you have a year or two or three years with very little precipitation, you might not have much water in the rivers at all. Plus that you're gonna have river, uh, river flow increasingly at the wrong times of year. Uh, there is something called the Karakoram anomaly, which is uh, some glaciers that are actually growing. Um, this is mainly in Pakistan, but there are a few of them in East uh, Tajikistan too. Um, this isn't fully understood, uh, but it's called an anomaly because it's not the main thing going on. The main thing going on is that the glaciers are melting fast and that this is uh, likely to accelerate. Um, and it is possible the anomaly is a temporary phenomenon due to uh, irrigation or due to uh, 
weather changing weather patterns at certain levels of temperature rise. And then as the temperature rises even more, you get even more widespread melting. So the overall picture is melting glaciers, and it is a very scary picture for Central Asia. In Turkmenistan, it has been estimated that by the 2090s, uh, which isn't that far off, um, it will be in the lifetime of people uh, who, some people who are alive today, um, the temperature may rise by 5.1 degrees Celsius, which is uh, a good bit above the global average. And that is in a country which already gets very hot uh, with the current climate. So this is quite a scary scenario. If we go back to 2014, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change um, did an analysis of all the available uh, research and data on climate change in Central Asia and found that there was less information available than for any other part of Asia. And they identified 54 thematic areas of climate research, which were relevant for Central Asia. And in 51 out of them, there was a lack of, um, of uh, information available to do a proper analysis. So that's also part of the background for our article. We are uh, coming in here um, eight years later. And one of the things we're interested in is uh, whether this gap has been filled, so whether there has been a rise in research on climate-related issues in Central Asia. And our analysis is what is called a systematic review, which is a type of uh, article. Um, we focus on the, or we deal with the English language academic literature uh, published during the post-Soviet period, so since 1991. And this is, of course, a limitation of our research in that we don't cover uh, the Russian language literature, the Chinese language literature, and so on. We look at all the literature we can get our hands on, journals, books, and gray literature, which means reports. We look at both natural and social sciences, and we look at uh, five different search engines databases. Crossref, Google, Google Scholar, Scopus, and Web of Science, which I think uh, means that if we haven't found some research, it's not very easy for anybody else to find it either. We use a Boolean search string, uh, building on some of our past research, but modified for the purposes of this, uh, this review, where we combine, as you see on the screen, the first, the, the upper big block of words are a, a lot of terms, uh, thematic terms related to climate change, um, but and to climate change mitigation. We combine, so, so what we're looking for is any publication which includes any of those words combined with uh, any of the names of the ethnic groups or countries in the region or the term uh, Central Asia. And we think that uh, enables us to identify most of the relevant literature in English. So this graph gives you a first glimpse of what we find. Um, 1990s, uh, basically very little, especially in the social sciences on climate related topics in Central Asia, a peak around 2013 to 2015, and then a plateau. And then it looks like it's going down, which it may be doing, or it may be that the, the databases weren't updated with recent publications when we were looking at them. Um, and this is very surprising because, as I mentioned, in 2014, the IPCC pointed out very big knowledge gaps. And from then on, the research uh, plateaued and maybe went down, especially in social sciences, which is we're looking at both natural and social sciences, but we are especially interested in social sciences, which is where we see the, the, the acute lack of knowledge. So we looked at um, journals. Area studies journals, uh, the two main ones on Central Asia, Central Asia Survey and Central Asia Affairs, but also at journals like Eurasian Geography, Geography and Economics, Journal of Eurasian Studies, and so on, where uh, people working on Central Asia uh, publish their work sometimes. Um, and 
what we find is that out of all of the journal, all of the articles published between 1991 and 2021, in Central Asia survey, 0.33% are about are relevant for climate change in some way. And in Central Asia affairs, 0.86%. So a leg up for uh, Central Asia affairs, but neither for neither of the journals has this been a big focus. Um, considering how severe a challenge and a risk climate change is for the region, this seems very low. My personal uh, interpretation is that this probably isn't mainly about the choice of the journals, but is mainly just reflecting what's going on in area studies on Central Asia. Uh, we also see that the other journals, uh, the broader post-Soviet area studies journals, uh, also have very little on climate change in general. So this is part of a broader phenomenon. But of course, it is Central Asia where this where climate change is a particular challenge, and you'd expect to see a bit more. If we look at subjects, it's also interesting to see that anthropology and international relations are the two fields of research, or two of the fields of research, which have the lowest representation. So people working in this areas, in these areas, have done very little on climate change. And I would say that these are two of the areas where there is most research done on Central Asia. Um, we have a, haven't actually measured that, but I know there are a lot of people doing anthropology, ethnography, or IR type stuff on Central Asia. So definitely um, there is a, a need to step up here. If we look at <clears throat> more specifically um, at the, the specific topics people are covering. Um, we see that water resources rightly gets a lot of attention and a lot of subtopics, uh, but there are two topics I'd like to highlight, and uh, they are migration, where we only found uh, a few publications about migration related to climate change, and again, conflict and security, only three publications. So, so these could be very important issues connected with the climate change, but very little attention so far. <clears throat> Next, uh, we look at, uh, we tried to find all of the conferences and seminars we could on Central Asia, mainly looking at 17, I was surprised even that there were as many as 17 uh, organizations around the world um, that work that are dedicated to Central Asia or Central Asia in the Middle East uh, and similar uh, topics. So 17 different organizations. We found, we, we found the programs for as many of their events as we could and also the programs of some other events. So in total, we're looking at 2,429 uh, conference or event panels. And we could, as far as we could find, there were zero dedicated to a climate range related topic. Um, and at, the, at these events, if you look at individual paper presentations, over 10,000, and we could find some on broader environmental issues. Uh, for example, Central Eurasian Study Societies, which is, had clearly most, had 50 panels on environmental issues. But if you look specifically at stuff related to climate change, we only found two presentations on that. My feeling is that we, we must have missed something. Uh, maybe out in the audience, there's somebody who's like, hey, have you found my presentation? But what I'm pretty sure about, so, so maybe we missed something, maybe the actual number is a bit, high, a bit higher than two, uh, than, uh, than two out of 10,000. But what I'm pretty sure about is that there's been very little focus on this in the Central Area Studies, uh, Central Asia Area Studies community. This has been clearly a blind, spot for a long time. Another interesting thing, uh, observation, is that out of the publications related to climate change in Central Asia that we found, 64 were uh, authored by teams based in Central Asia. 36 were, were authored by teams based outside Central Asia. Now, we can actually we can't actually say anything about the proportions. Is this 
a disproportionate number of one or the other uh, geographical base, because we don't know uh, about all publications on Central Asia and how many of them are authored by people based in the region and how many based outside, because then we would have to take all publications in Central Asia and look up the authors um, and where they're based. And that would be that would be another article for sure. Um, so we're not sure about how proportional this, this balance is, but at least my, my gut feeling would be that people in the region are more focused on this topic than people outside the region. We also find that a lot of the publications that exist are, are done by people who specialize in climate change and specialize in specific topics uh, within climate change. So it might be um, the effects of uh, climate change on a very, you know, on cotton farming and the social um, situation around cotton farming. Um, so often linked to very specific topic and often linked to specific natural science topic that you get some social science. Uh, uh, we found much less research looking at the macroeconomic, uh, the political, health, geopolitical, uh, gender, and broader sociological dimensions of climate change in Central Asia. And it was striking that the very same people who have done a lot of work on security issues, on the risk of armed conflict, of ethnic conflict within states and between states in Central Asia, have almost totally ignored the climate change factor uh, as a catalyst for these conflicts. Big blind spot. So why is it, wh wh why do we have this situation? Um, and this is, now I'm talking for myself, I, not for the other co-authors of the, uh, other authors of the article, uh, because we haven't, didn't write, write this part in the article. And, and this is more speculative, but, my feeling is that academia has a tendency, and I mean specifically academia, so as a university and research institutes, um, has a tendency to get stuck on a certain path. And I think one of the reasons for this is that existing power and institutional structures are self-reinforcing. So if you want to do write your MA thesis, which the population of MA theses is important for what people write their PhD theses on later on. So if you want to write your MA thesis or PhD thesis, um, you are, there is a tendency that you'll be guided to do it on a topic that your supervisor works on, which will be a topic that, which is likely to be a topic that the institution where your supervisor works and where you're studying uh, has a tradition to work on. So you get this, this, the, the, the people in power, the people with influence um, have a, a, a tend to, to uh, continue and cultivate the topics that are already being worked on and that they worked on in the past when they were younger. And I, I've, I wonder whether this is one reason why we get this immense focus in the literature on culture, ethnography, cultural artifacts, uh, things like pottery or carpets and so on, history, language, clans. Um, and whether this, if you look way back at this path that we seem to be dependent on, could be thought of as growing out of old Orientalist and colonialist approaches to Central Asia, where it is this exotic cultural faraway thing that one as, an, as a researcher studies, and then introduces the home audience to. Um, so kind of an exotification instead of uh, studying the big and looming social issues in the region. This isn't something I can prove, but I think there are interesting reflections to, to uh, maybe pursue in the future. So what do we suggest for future research? Well, our overarching uh, suggestion is to do more research on climate change and its impacts on the societies, politics, and economics in Central Asia. How do we get there? More funding um, needed, um, uh, general funding, funding for research projects, funding for, for uh, PhD, 
uh, theses and postdocs, um, encourage our colleagues in Central Asia studies to work more on this area, which is what I'm doing with this presentation. Um, maybe the organizers of major events on Central Asia uh, could give this a thought and give a little space, maybe, maybe uh, special calls for this topic. Um, more cooperation between researchers and NGOs, international organizations, and government agencies in the Central Asian states. Um, there's, there's been more focus on uh, climate change on, in NGOs and IOs, in uh, international organizations, so that they might have a positive effect on us academics. Maybe some journal special issues on climate-related topics in Central Asia. And I think important uh, not just to think and work on uh, the climate change mitigation uh, cl on the climate impacts and adaptation in Central Asia, which is what I've mostly focused on in the beginning of this presentation, uh, but also on Central Asia's own contribution to mitigating climate mitigation and to decarbonization. Uh, Central Asia has three significant oil and gas producers and also produces and consumes quite a lot of coal. Um, so it's, it's relevant um, in that perspective. Uh, at the same time as these are developing countries and there are very important issues in relation to climate justice and whose responsibility this is and who should take the lead on mitigating climate change, which are broader issues that concern um, the whole uh, industrialized wor world versus the, the uh, developing world uh, with interesting special um, angles in Central Asia. For our part, we are working on an edited volume uh, with a lot of different uh, contributors on climate change and decarbonization issues in Central Asia. Um, this will be published in the series of edited volumes that is published by the OEC Academy in Kyrgyzstan and uh, the Springer publisher. Um, and this, this edited volume will be out, will be open access, will be published uh, in December or January. So at the, at the around New Year's Eve. <clears throat> and we hope this will further uh, raise attention uh, or, or, or attract attention to this field of research. Here is the reference to the uh, article where we present in much more detail uh, what I've been talking about today. It's available online, openly. And uh, with that, I end my presentation. Thank you for listening. I know it's uh, uh, difficult to listen online. Um, and uh, thank you to Central Asia Survey for publishing our article. I think that's appropriate to say since they're one of the journals we, we mentioned who hasn't published enough on, central, on, on climate change topics, but they did publish our article. So they've, they've atoned. Uh, for past sins. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so, so much, Indra, for this, uh, I mean, important, uh, for this paper, which raises uh, an important point, so which is a lack of, uh, of research on climate change. And indeed, I mean, striking to see uh, in Western sources, uh, the scarcity of uh, academic papers on, uh, on this issue, but also, I would say, for example, in, in international reports on environment that Central Asia is unfortunately often addressed in a very rapid or superficial way in the midst of many uh, other states and, uh, and issues. Uh, there are some questions, important questions on uh, methodology. Uh, so what fact, beyond uh, the lack of published research on climate change, in Central Asia, what factors prompt you to conclude that little attention is paid uh, to climate change in Central Asia? Can we merely rely on data from the Western publishing platforms? And if so, uh, what does it tell about the accessibility of those platforms for not Western authors? Uh, additionally, what are the stats on research produced by local authors as opposed to Western scholars? And which brings in a way another question. So you said that you couldn't include uh, papers in local languages and Russian. So do you know if any other research has been conducted with, uh, in local languages and Russian sources uh, as the one you have done in, with Western sources? And if yes, what were the results? 
so we haven't looked into this. So this is a limitation of our research, uh, clearly. Um, we, or I think that um, to be truly available to the international community, you kind of need to publish in English. Um, there may be some research in Chinese, but there is almost nobody outside China uh, who uh, speaks Chinese, except, except for a very small number of people who are, who are academic experts on China. Um, so there may be more out there, but it's not really available to other, to the broader international community if it isn't English. The same for, of course, anything published in Scandinavian languages where we are based and so on. Um, but I do think it would be very interesting if anybody who has the right language skills, uh, we speak Russian, but um, so we could do, we could potentially do uh, a follow-up article on the Russian side of this, uh, but not Chinese. It'd be really interesting to see the Chinese and Russian, maybe French, maybe German, maybe a smattering of other languages um, and, and see what else is out there that is not in the, the Anglosphere. Uh, so I think that's a great uh, possibility for future research. Concerning local authors um, versus uh, uh, international authors. Um, so, so in terms of the ethnic background, that's quite a tricky thing to go into people's identities. Uh, so what we did was we looked at where people are based. Um, so, uh, uh, and then we have these numbers, uh, which I showed in the presentation, where we show that there's a bit over 60% of the publications are authored by people based at institutions in Central Asia, and uh, a bit over 30% are by people based at institutions in the West. But of course, uh, especially many of those who are based at institutions in the West may also potentially be originally from the region. We don't know how long they've been uh, outside the region um, uh, and whether they are now citizens of, uh, of uh, non-Central Asian countries and so on. Um, but at least uh, the impression is that, that locals are paying more attention to this than people outside the region. So it's something for us people who are, who are not based in Central Asia to maybe uh, listen um, to the locals. Uh, second question, I mean, still on your methodology, uh, has your research reviewed uh, projects implemented by international donor community, for example, USAID, KEYS, or the World Bank? I mean, uh, there are many climate change activities on the way within the region, so this project include publications, workshops, uh, conferences, and other publications. Uh, no, we have not. So we have not looked at projects of international organizations or NGOs or, or and we haven't looked at academic projects either. So our interest has been in output, uh, which I think, you know, also being another another hobby horse of mine is the the bureaucratization of research. And there is this tendency to 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 focus on on projects um, and the bureaucracy around the projects which are not necessarily always productive. I just mean this at a general level. Um, so uh, what's important from a research, in a research perspective is your output, which would be mainly pu publications of some sort, and especially in the major journals, and secondarily um, uh, conference presentations. So this is output, which is available where your knowledge is uh, shared, can be shared by a broad, uh, uh, audience and in the case of in the case of publications, um, especially if they're openly available online, can be seen by by anybody. Anybody, and of course, we're also we've been especially interested in peer-reviewed publications, which have some kind of um, uh, quality assurance with them. Um, so it is true that international organizations have more activities, are more aware of this, perhaps because they're again. Uh, have offices in the Central Asian countries are present on the ground and more in contact with, with what's actually going on uh, in the region. Um, but in terms of research, um, we see they play a role, uh, but not as big a role as maybe they could. 
A uh, question now, maybe more on uh, on the impact of climate change. I mean, the, uh, the question is: Does the statement that the glaciers in Tajik and Kyrgyzstan can supply water for ten years mean that they will have melted uh, ten years from now? Uh, and if not, uh, how should this statement be interpreted? Can Can you repeat the first part of that? Does the statement that the glaciers in Tajikistan and Kyrgyzstan can supply water for 10 years mean that they will have melted 10 years from now? No. So that, that, was, that was just... So the point is that the volume of those glaciers is enough to feed the rivers for 10 years. Um, but they are not... It doesn't mean that they will necessarily melt in 10 years. Um, and also the rivers are not only fed by the glaciers. The glaciers are very important for the stabilization of river flow and for the seasonal variation. Um, but they, there are, they, I mean, there is also rainfall coming in, uh, which doesn't go into glaciers, but which, which uh, goes into the river. So it doesn't, the glaciers will not necessarily be away in, in 10 years. Um, uh, and exactly how long it'll take before the glaciers vanishes, I'm, I, that you'd have to ask an, a natural scientist about that. Or, or look at the most recent assessment report of the IPCC. Uh, so talking about uh, research on climate change in Central Asia, uh, I think it's necessary uh, to look at how research and work on climate change is conducted uh, within Central Asian countries. And one of the problems is that there's also not enough environmental research conducted by Central Asian researchers. I mean, don't get me wrong, there are there is research, but probably not enough. I mean, uh, I have a, que a question that uh, what would be the role of Central Asian governments to improve knowledge on climate change on, in Central Asian countries, or said uh, in a different way, do the government, Central Asian governments bear responsibility of the lack of uh, knowledge? I mean, I'm asking this question because uh, if you look, uh, I mean, the Central Asian governments actually invest little in research. I mean, if you look at the figures uh, the Kazakhstan government uh, funding of research and development activities is at about 0.12% of, uh, of its GDP. Uh, Uzbekistan is about 0.2%, which is low, and the figures for the countries of the region is even lower. And generally, I mean, these figures uh, are higher in other countries. So in Asia, for example, China is at 2.1, and uh, the world average uh, for uh, it's about 1.7. So, and another issue is a lack of freedom of a, uh, uh, I mean, the lack of academic freedom, censorship, and political authorities in Central Asia have tried to keep a control on issues uh, surrounding uh, the environment and climate change. So, the question is what should be the role of Central Asian governments to develop research on climate change and to what extent do you consider that the government policy impact maybe this lack of research that you address in your paper, including, for example, the difficulty for Western scholars to work in these countries, in Central Asian countries on this, uh, on these topics? Well, I think like, like all governments in the world, the Central Asian uh, states have a responsibility for, for um, facilitating and promoting collective action in this area, which, in, which and research is part of that collection, collective action. And like many states in the world, uh, they have failed to do so. Um, and especially in, in many developing countries around the world, we see that the state has is, is not very interested in climate change. And as soon as you try to discuss it, um, you, uh, they will start talking about climate justice issues, which are, uh, um, which are very important, but which are maybe not the basis for building new coal power plants. Um, so, so there are challenges there. And I would think that the, in Central Asia, the, the situation, so one thing is what they should do. Another thing is try to understand why have they not done what they have not done. Uh, and I would say that probably part of the, the situation there is one, especially the three of the states, which are, are major fossil fuel producers, that, that, that that's, I mean, any fossil fuel producer like Norway, for example, where I live, tends to be slower on, on climate awareness, climate action, and, and the government pr promoting research on this. So that's holding the region back. And the other one is that these states have been very busy building their uh, national identity um, and um, 
uh, focusing on that instead of more abstract problems like climate change. But uh, it appears that climate change is becoming less and less abstract and more and more um, concrete. Um, it's very hot in some parts of Central Asia at the moment, and recent summers have seen very high temperatures. Um, and I wonder if we might be about to see, and I would hope that we would be about to see, um, a, a rising interest on the part of the local states also uh, for, for uh, working on climate change. And censorship is another problem because to, 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 prom to genuinely promote, or even if you're just going to put um, substantial funding into climate research specifically, you have to be comfortable with a strong uh, research community. And uh, having a strong research community is going to increase the likelihood that you're going to get analyzed and criticized in the government. Um, so that could be another challenge for the Central Asian states and another reason to, uh, to uh, work for more democracy in the region so that the states can then engage more actively with climate issues. Uh, one more question. I received one more question on methodology. Were any of your co-authors from a local, I mean, from a Central Asian institution or any Central Asian organization? I mean, there are uh, indeed several uh, institutions which probably are working on, uh, on that. For example, the German Kazakh University, uh, the Tashkent Institute for of Irrigation and Agricultural Mechanization Engineers, or the University in Central Asia. And they probably have some staff and uh, scholars working on this topic. So the question is, yes, uh, were uh, some of your courses part of these organizations? So none of the, none, none of the authors of this article are, from, uh, are based at an institution in Central Asia. The lead author, Roman Vakulchuk, is uh, from Kazakhstan, although he's working in Norway at the moment. Um, and as I mentioned, this article grew, is not part of a research project or anything like that. It grew out of a conversation we had uh, in Oslo at one point between our two institutions. Um, in the book, which we will be publishing at the end of this year, there will, which is an edited volume, there will be uh, many contributions from people based in the region and from the region. Uh, to study and address uh, the issues of climate change, uh, one uh, element is probably, which is probably essential, very important, uh, which is a lack of uh, in, uh, of civil society in Central Asia. I mean, uh, I'm not saying that there are no civil society organizations working on these issues. Yes, there are. I mean, you have uh, environmentalists trying to uh, really addressing this topic, but the political authoritarianism of Central Asian countries has uh, significantly limited the ability of CSOs and uh, to work on sensitive, sensitive topics, uh, which include environment. We know, for example, that in all Central Asia to varying degrees, uh, political authorities restrict the activities of local and foreign NGOs through uh, restrictive laws, through censorship, and even repression of environmental activists. We've seen that uh, unfortunately more and more since the last two years everywhere, including, for example, in Kazakhstan. Uh, and civil society so really has struggled, I mean, to promote dialogue with uh, the government. So I was wondering if you could say a few words on the role of the civil society in promoting knowledge and interest on climate change in Central Asia, and also maybe as an essential source of information for foreign researchers. So research-wise, this is not a topic I've actually worked on. It's not, also not the topic of this article. So. Um, but I am familiar with it from, from other activities a little bit. Um, uh, there are actually some uh, civil society activists, some organizations working on this topic in the Central Asian countries, but they're quite small and it is very difficult for them to get attention, um, to, to kind of break through to society and to the state. And I think this goes back to the, the question that uh, you raised earlier, mm -hmm. the, the role of the local, the state, the Central Asian states or governments is very important because on the one hand, they're holding, many of these governments are holding back civil society to some extent, very, very much really repressing civil society. And on the other hand, they are not uh, particularly interested in climate change themselves. 
Um, and the, the combination makes it very difficult for the civil society to reach out to, to society, to the broader society, especially because m very many people in these societies have many other worries, uh, such as poverty. Um, so, so if society, civil society activists are to have any chance to, to, to get through to the rest of society, the, a more positive attitude on the part of the states is going to be uh, decisive. So, I mean, we talk about uh, Central, uh, I mean, here uh, we talk about Central Asia as a whole region. Uh, regarding the work done on climate change, in your research, did you still notice some differences from one country to another? I mean, for example, uh, more focus on some of countries than on others. I mean, uh, some countries like Turkmenistan, we know, are very difficult to work on. So when it comes to the knowledge on Central Asia, in, uh, on climate change, so in Central Asia, are there even bigger gaps for some of this, uh, some of Central Asian countries? Um, so yes, well, Turkmenistan, there's very little done. Um, the country that, where there is a, a, a proportionately larger amount of research done is Kyrgyzstan, which I think maybe says something about the fact that Kyrgyzstan has been uh, de facto a little bit on and off, but mostly um, a freer society with a less oppressive state than most of the countries in the region. Um, there is also a good bit of work on uh, Kazakhstan and then uh, a bit less on the others. Uh, the next question, so you point out in your presentation and your paper a very important uh, impact, one of the very important impact of climate change, which is migration. Indeed, uh, it's really hard to, to, to find information on that, I and mean, it's barely studied, at least in Western sources. Have you been able to collect, I mean, uh, good information on that? Could you just maybe explain the different trends, which country are most affected now or in the future regarding uh, the impact of climate change on migrations? So what we've done in the research I presented here, we're not actually doing research, we're, we're reviewing the existence of other research. Um, and I, I haven't personally worked on eco-migration, um, so it's not something I'm a specialist on. But what we observed is that there is surprisingly, well, one, um, the climate research that does exist points to migration as one of the possible main consequences of climate change in Central Asia, and one of the main destabilizing consequences of climate change in Central Asia. And that is because uh, a large part of Central Asia is not really habitable, because it's desert, lack of water already, or it is step very far from infrastructure and some of that step might become uh, desertified. Um, so the, the you, I mean, Central Asia doesn't have very high dense, density population, but the population that does exist in Central Asia is concentrated, tends to be concentrated in relatively narrow uh, bands of habitable um, areas where, uh, if these shrink due to uh, desertification um, or become more difficult to live in due to very high temperatures during the summer, um, the, the trigger for migration could be quite strong. Um, and the other thing is that the, 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 the capacity of the states to manage these flows um, the, is limited. The existence of some tensions in the region which could be exacerbated by or 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 tr triggered again by these flows um, is is certainly present and uh, uh, of course Central Asia is a very important um, uh, region for out migration already mainly to Russia but the viability of that in the long term is unknown maybe there will be more Central Asian migration to Russia in the future or maybe less depending on developments in Russia and in Central Asia. So I think, again, this is a very hot topic. And the other thing to say about migration and climate change, um, which concerns Central Asia, but, but is a, it, is, it is a general challenge uh, to work on. It's migration, migration and conflict are two different, to some extent, connected topics. Um, so migration, conflict, and climate change, which are, are some of the most 
high risk issues related to climate change, some of the things we probably should be most worried about, but which are also some of the most difficult things to make predictions about. It's very difficult to predict how climate change may impact on migration and conflict in Central Asia or in any part of the world. And there are big discussions in the climate literature about these, these topics and a lot of disagreement about what you can prove and not prove and what you can say and not prove about the future. Uh, another qu interesting question is how can one relate climate change to cultural changes in the region and how the ethnographers or anthropologists engage in understanding climate change through cultural studies? Do you, I don't know if you can respond to that. I think that's a really important topic uh, in Central Asia, but also in other mm -hmm. parts of the world, uh, because um, climate change is set to change the context in which people live their lives, um, transforming economies, transforming relation within and between groups. Um, and it is very likely that these things will have an impact on cultures and cultural phenomena. So I think, and, 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 and again, as I was saying, it's very difficult to say uh, anything with certainty about the impact of climate change on migration and conflict. And one way of trying to find out more would be to go into the micro level and do ethno ethnographic work to try to understand any impacts that are already occurring um, and the vul where the vulnerability lies and the possible trigger points. So where in a certain area, in the villages in a certain area, um, could there be um, vulnerabilities, sensitivities, things that might reach a tipping point uh, at the social, cultural, economic, political level locally uh, if climate change has certain um, effects. So you might, you, you might want to, for example, take uh, the, the recent, the, the sixth assessment report of the IPCC, which, which gives ranges, possible ranges of change, and then say, well, what, what happens if we're in the middle of this range? Or what happens if we're in the upper level of this range? How does that look from the, local, from the perspective of local people in a local community uh, in Central Asia? Uh, another question is, uh, if you had the chance to look at how experts on agriculture and food security uh, are addressing the issue of climate change in Central Asia, and uh, another question related to that, I know that you said that we're not working specifically on the climate change, but to what extent uh, climate change will impact food security in the, in the region? I don't know if you can give a, a few trends about, uh, about that. It's also a very serious risk for the region, um, which is very vulnerable to disruptions of food supply, also with poverty, with, with the, um, you know, it's not like, not like an OECD country, which can basically go on the world market and buy the food it needs. Um, so there will always be enough food in an OECD country. In the Central Asian states, that's not certain. Um, so this is a, a very serious concern and something that needs more study. Um, both in terms of the systemic level, like how robust is food supply, how much of it comes locally, how much of that is sensitive, how much comes from outside, how much more could come from outside, and in terms of the the uh, the of poverty, uh, malnutrition, um, uh, especially malnutrition of girls in poor areas of uh, some of these countries, um, and I think that this this topic is understudied in Central Asia. Central Asia studies. And I think there's going to be more push for it uh, because the war in Ukraine uh, looks like it is leading, and also climate developments around the world, looks like it's leading to uh, greater global problems with food supply. Uh, so that's going to, going to highlight the importance of this topic at a general level. Great, a, a great thing to work on. All right, we're getting close to, to the end. I don't see uh, any more questions. Maybe before we conclude, Indra, do you want to say final words? Any comment on the questions? Anything you would like to add? Um, well, thanks uh, to you, Sebastian, for hosting this and Aires, um, uh, uh, and for giving me the opportunity to highlight these topics, which I think are really important. Um, 
I hope we will see a lot more research in this area. And that's not just because I'm something interested in myself, but because I think it's, it's genuinely important. And because I think social society should make a positive, should not just study society, but should also make a positive contribution uh, to the development of society through analysis. Um, uh, so, I, I, and, and above all, thanks to the audience for uh, listening to me uh, digitally, which I know can be a bit tricky. All right, and my turn. So first to thank you, Indra, for, for your presentation, for this uh, very rich uh, discussion. Uh, again, I strongly recommend our audience reading not only uh, the paper on which uh, Indra's presentation was based, but also all his other uh, papers. I would like to thank, of course, our audience for being with us today. So, and we look forward to having you again in one of our upcoming Central Asia program semitons. So thank you very, very much again. Have a nice day or have a nice evening. Thank you. Goodbye.